it really extends to how wide a web of contacts uh, you know Will Rag had to be able to see how far this kind of stretches and whether actually further people who were then contacted and whether it worked, this spear phishing program worked, whether more people gave more numbers and that kind of web uh, extends out. But we've certainly not heard the, the, the last of it. And I imagine when you speak to, to Dan later, there'll, there'll be more on this in terms of, of who is, is be, has been targeted. Now, a second Conservative MP has revealed he was targeted in the Westminster sexting scandal. Dr Luke Evans, the MP for Bosworth, says he was cyber flashed when he was sent an image of a naked woman on WhatsApp without warning. In a video on Facebook, Dr Evans revealed he was the politician who first told the police about the scam. It is a video I didn't expect to make on a Friday evening, but a month ago I was a victim of cyber flashing and malicious communications and blew the whistle by reporting it to the police and the parliamentary authorities as soon as this happened. The first set of messages I got was on a day I was with my wife and I got a one-time open photo on WhatsApp of an explicit image of a naked lady. As soon as I got these, the next day I reported it to the police, the authorities and the chief whip. Ten days later, I got another set of messages. This time, however, I was sat with my team in the constituency office. So we were able to record the conversation and catch photos and videos of the messages coming through, including another explicit female image. Why am I talking about this now? Well, I actually wanted it to be private because there's an ongoing investigation. It's been ongoing for a month. You've probably seen in the national media. I've been hounded by journalists asking me about it. It's not too difficult to work out. There are only a few Leicestershire MPs. So I've put my name up to say, well, I hope others come forward. I'm just pleased I blew the whistle, reported it to the authorities, and it's now being looked into. Well, let's speak now to Alan Tolhurst, Chief Reporter at Politics Home Morning. Morning, Chloe. So it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, Luke Evans has come out as an MP saying, look, this is what I received. It comes off the back, of course, of the Times reporting yesterday that William Rag MP had apologised for basically passing on the personal phone numbers of staffers and lots of MPs to someone that he met on a dating app after exchanging explicit photos with them. It's like a drip drip at the moment, isn't it, Alan, with the information we're getting? And there's an ex-MP who's also come out and a former staffer as well saying that they've been approached. Yes, and I think we'll, we'll continue to see that number rise as people feel either emboldened to be able to come forward and say it, or in, in, in Luke Evans's case, kind of forced to. He mentioned there that he's there are a few Leicester MPs. When we heard that Leicester police were looking into it, I, I looked at the list of MPs. There's only sort of six male MPs, four of them are conservative. It kind of didn't wasn't a hard process of elimination to work out who it might have, have been. And so I think there's a few more eventually we'll, we'll get that to that point. And I guess it really extends to how wide a web of contacts uh, you know Will Rag had to be able to see how far this kind of stretches and whether actually further people who were then contacted and whether it worked, this spear phishing program worked, whether more people gave more numbers and that kind of web uh, extends out. But we've certainly not heard the, the, the last of it. And I imagine when you speak to, to Dan later, there'll, there'll be more on this in terms of, of who is, is be, has been targeted. Mm. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting from this is um, an ex-staffer uh, for an MP, sorry, a staffer from an MP said, actually, my, I was approached through this this same process, but actually, I don't ever recall meeting him, Rag. I don't know why William Rag would have a number, which begs the question that maybe that's not the only way that this sexting scandal, ha you know, the numbers, there are other people who were involved, has there been a different approach? And indeed, what is the motive for it? Yeah, completely. And I, I think that there's probably a couple of reasons, a couple of examples there. You, you know, it might be that... You know, people are, are part of WhatsApp groups, MPs are part of WhatsApp groups for different committees they're on or different events they go to. And so there's a chance that those numbers are accessible. We, you know, as, as a reporter, you're always searching around for, for numbers and you put up spreadsheets of, of numbers together. Or it may be that the, that person didn't meet Will Rag, but someone else that has been contacted through Will Rag does have their number. Um, although, you know, there are lots of other ways, as we know, legal and illegal means of getting hold of people's mobile phone numbers. So, yeah, and I think, but as to the, I think, you know, I don't think it's necessarily just a kind of an attempt to create mischief. There is clearly an attempt to try and extract in more more information and, and by getting in with someone like Will Rag and then going up from there, maybe trying to get more and more numbers, perhaps trying to get more senior people, cabinet ministers, et cetera, et cetera, and eventually some more compromising information. I think that's potentially what this has, has been done. But also, you know, we know that some people just want to cause a bit of 
you know, mischief want to cause some some harm, want to cause some embarrassment. And it certainly caused that for a lot of MPs. Mm. Let's move on and talk about the story on the front page of The Times today, this pressure on junior doctors to end their strikes after consultants made a deal with the government. And um, I mean, the junior doctors have really dug their heels in. It's going to be very interesting to see if this changes anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, th there was a point at which they were sort of both the consultants and the junior doctors were in, in lockstep. They both went on these joint strikes or concerted strikes and stuff. But they've, you know, it, the junior doctors are pretty firm on this 35% figure. And the government obviously don't want to go that that high. And w there's been a real lack of even talks. We know that Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, has had recently talks about talks. That's as far as it's got. So whether this will affect them, I'm not really sure that it necessarily Will, we know that the duty doctors are more than happy to carry on this work, they're more than happy, and they've still got you know support within their base. There's less public support than there was for these strikes for the longer they go on, but I wonder if they see the election in sight and think there's a good chance of them being able to push this all the way up to an election. Obviously, the government would love to say they got this stuff resolved and we're starting to tackle those backlogs, but I think the, the junior doctors are pretty firm on the 35%, so they won't be coming down from that mountain anytime soon. Really interesting piece in The Times today. Um, it feels like all the time we keep getting different polls ahead of a general election about what is likely to happen. And YouGov have done a seat-by-seat -seat analysis um, on what is likely to happen at the next election. Just take us through what they found. Yeah, so unsurprisingly, they're, they're suggesting that Labour are going to get a, a massive majority, around 154 seat majority, so an enormous landslide. But what's also interesting is that they're... Their vote share has not is not sort of universally picked up across the board. And so in some um, urban seats where under Jeremy Corbyn in 2017, 2019, they actually did really well and better than they had previously, sort of racked up votes in seats they already had, but didn't win you know, marginal seats. And so their, their vote share was quite inefficient. This makes it seem like their vote share is actually going to be more efficient. They're not going to win those seats in cities by as many votes, but in a sense, that doesn't really matter. And they're picking up seats elsewhere. And we're seeing kind of the reverse that happened in 2019, where in the seats that uh, the Tories flipped from Labour, it wasn't necessarily about the Tories racking up loads of votes. It was the Labour's vote share sort of collapsed. What we're seeing is kind of the reversal of that by this showing that either um, you know, in those seats that the Tories have held for a while, and certainly since 2010, their vote share is, is falling massively, either by voters just not turning up for them or by going to reform, who obviously are standing in, in as we imagine, every single seat. So it's a very good poll um, for Labour and it kind of shows the real the real breadth of, of, of difficulty that Conservatives find themselves in. Mm. And you mentioned Reform UK. I mean, the I reporting today, they've got the highest polling yet. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they're getting within a couple of points of the Conservatives in some of this polling. And I mean, you know, we... You often quick to dismiss if it's one poll or two polls, but they are consistently getting into the double figures now. And that is the sort of thing that would cause, as, as some uh, Tory MPs have, have, have described it to me, an extinction level event for their party, because it will just damage them in all those seats they need to try and hold. Because for them now, it's the strategy is, you know, they try and basically abandon those seats they won last time in, in 2019 and just hold the seats they had in 2015 when David Cameron got the majority. But that doesn't seem likely because of the threat of reform it just makes all of those kind of Labour Tory marginals, you know, very, very difficult to hold on to now. Um, I want to ask you as well about an exclusive interview in The Times today with the Met's Director of Intelligence, Lindsay Chiswick, making quite an, an incredible statement about the use of facial recognition and that technology, how it's essentially changed policing. Yeah, they're, they're calling it a, a game changer. The, the police have always been very keen on using this as a tool. Obviously, they've the by what you do is you set up these fixed um, vans with cameras on the on, and it scans people as they go past, and then that that is fed into uh, their intelligence stuff, and then that's used then to have what they would call intelligence-led policing. There have obviously been huge kind of civil rights concerns, issues about how how this kind of uh, works, who whether it targets certain people over others. But the, for the police, they think that it's it's proven a, a, a massive success, and they keen to see it kind of rolled out further. I know that the government, the policing minister, Chris Philp, has been kind of won over by a lot of this as well. And we could see a kind of a, a policy statement, a policy change maybe later in the spring to see that kind of rolled out further. I think there'll be a lot of pushback, like I said, from, from civil rights groups and, and campaigners, but the government, the, the police, who obviously have been, you know, 
tackling having fewer police numbers they see this as kind of a way of kind of pushing back against that and helping them into in, in terms of um in terms of catching people and it is incredible i mean when they're talking about triggering an arrest every two hours of alleged criminals including rapists burglars and robbers since it was introduced last april it really is quite incredible um, and finally i want to ask you as well alan about um, nadim zahawi writing in the times today basically calling for a complete overhaul of the post office what's he suggesting yeah, he's basically saying that it's it's completely damaged, essentially. In a, you know, as he says as a brand, um, as an institution, a place of work, that it's it's completely gone. And he points to things like the fact that they've spent twice as much money on lawyers as they have on compensation so far, and so things like the the payouts for those involved in the Horizon scandal. And actually, if it's to continue into the twenty first century, which is already facing lots of, of of difficulties, that it needs to be completely changed. It needs to be perhaps um, you know the different bits that were split up, brought back together, a new name new leadership and, and completely changing it which i think you know given what we've seen and and, and there's another story in the times today about uh, the widow of, of a postmaster who committed suicide being denied payment um in, under this compensation scheme i can understand why you know it feels like if there is to be trust again in the post office as an institution there has to be such a huge change basically in, in the way that it operates mm. really interesting stuff thank you ever so much that is alan tolhurst who is chief reporter at politics home and you can read that comment piece by nadim zahari if you've got a digital subscription now now you can go online. It's in the comments section. Um, you can go onto the web, the web, that'd be the, the app or the website. <laughs>